Um, so one way to kind of enter into this is, I don't know uh, if you've ever read uh, Philip Roth's novel, um, The uh, I Married a Communist. Uh, well, I, I haven't, no. I, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very poorly read person in literature. And in literature, very, very well read in history. Fair enough. Uh, so in that, in that book, um, there's, you know, a lot of it's about the, uh, as the title might suggest, the American Communist Party and McCarthyism and, you know, Ross Anger, you know, McCarthy yeah. at Witch Hunters. Uh, but one thing that actually comes up pretty extensively in the book uh, is that these like 1930s kind of popular front era communists uh, were, were really obsessed with, uh, with Thomas Paine. Right? Yeah. So, uh, so why, yeah, I was Does wondering that if- come up? Does that come up in the novel? That comes up extensively in the novel. I'm get you just made it that I have to read it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you'll you'll enjoy the book. It's it's very good. Okay. But um, uh, but I guess I guess I I think it might be that might be an interesting jumping off point for some of what we we're talking about talking about like like why is it that like out of all of the you know the the founders uh, you know the American revolutionaries uh, why is it that that Payne is one who um, the, the American left, you know, radicals have historically been so interested in? Okay, that's a, that, that is a good question. And it, it can be answered in a sort of, sort of direct, direct sort of list way. Uh, for example, he, he, he never owned slaves. How's that for a start? I mean, that's okay. a pretty good start. Okay, number one. Number two, his first significant intervention, when he came over from, from England, and he was already almost middle-aged, he... Uh, he got he secured a job which was completely a, a complete sort of new thing for him as the editor of a new magazine in Philadelphia, and his very and he wrote a lot of things. But the very first thing he wrote of a of a direct political intervention sort was actually a call to bring an end to slavery in America. Okay, and it wasn't just and it wasn't one of those things that said we should end slavery and send African Americans or Africans back to Africa. It wasn't a colonizationist. He actually talked about the responsibility of providing education and land. So, uh, okay, that's worthy. So, so that's first of all. And, and by the way, Thomas Paine's writings were never out of print. And in the 1930s, um, the entire left was reading Thomas Paine from the liberals of the FDR New Deal administration over to the Communist Party. And in fact, Eleanor Roosevelt, just as a sidebar to that, Eleanor Roosevelt herself wrote a little book titled Moral Democracy moral democracy, something like that. And it was all about the American tradition. And it's pretty clear that she was reading communist writers to enhance her ability to write about democracy. And the person she quoted the most, I think she devotes five pages in a 100 page book to Thomas Paine. So indeed, Philip Roth was, was right on to, be, to, to make something of Paine. And I do have to read the novel. But, but it is the case that in every generation, every generation in American history, when radicals or, or even liberals, progressives, whatever we want to call them, whenever they united for struggle, whether it was for free thought, that is to, to, to make sure that the separation of church and state was really a separation of church and state, mm. abolitionists, uh, feminists, uh, labor unionists, socialists, progressives, anarchists, who am I leaving out as we go along? But you've got the idea, every single struggle, they always reach back to the revolution. There is that kind of sort of instinctive reaching back to the revolution in order to, if you like, bolster or validate their cause. And when you reach back to the revolution, inevitably you get, be you not only go to the declaration's words, yeah. okay, all men are created equal, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you end up necessarily discovering and recovering Thomas Paine. I mean, Thomas Paine, you know, in school, they teach you that Thomas Paine was the author of a pamphlet that incited the, the struggle for independence or turned the struggle of a, that was a rebellion into a revolution. But it's not just a revolution for independence. In fact, Paine once said, if the struggle was only about independence, it wouldn't have been worth pursuing. There was something like that. But the fact was that Paine actually argued for something that was rather unprecedented at the time, and that is he argued for creating a democratic republic. So if you go back to Thomas Paine and you're reading this pamphlet, which really does make the case that, that Americans had, excuse this for and most people on the left to get upset when I mention this, that Americans had a, a, a historic, a world historic opportunity to fight for human rights, 
not simply for British rights and or for what would, might well be called later in after the Constitution American rights. And among the lines he argue, he offers is we have it in our power to begin the world over again, yeah. which, is, which has got to be the, the most absolutely true and absolutely untrue <laughs> statement at one and the same time. As a debunker, yeah, that's also, it's also a nice echo there to the, um, the lyric from uh, Solidarity Forever, right? You know, we have a power to make a new world out of the ashes of the old. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, so, but but I, I just want to point out that when yeah. he says that, he, he actually talks about never since the, you know, the time of Noah have we had the opportunity to start over again, that kind of thing. And, and what really makes it significant is not just, I mean, Payne, Payne wasn't simply, you know, one, a genius writer. He wasn't just, I mean, he was a working class man, basically. Yeah. Um, but he had, but it, what it is, is that he could speak in such a way that everyone understood, or he could write so that everyone understood him. And moreover, and this is, this is really the thing that, that I think is important, is that he actually was sort of holding up a mirror to mm. Americans as to what they were already doing in their rebellion. So he's, and he never claimed any originality, and essentially that's what he was doing. And I want to make it clear that if we think about the greatest of the revolutionary writers, and if we go next, say, to, to Karl Marx, I mean, if, yeah. you, if one reads the, look, Das Kapital is... is, is <laughs> not riveting reading. Okay. Um, it's got its moments, it, but it's, it's not a page turner. Right. I mean, I never bother to have my students read, read Capital yeah. or even the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts, because mm. I'm talking about freshmen and sophomores quite often. But to read the Communist Manifesto is to read something which is both historically questionable and historically true. He really is talking about what he sees taking place in the course of mid 19th century Europe and sees the possibilities that are, that are emergent there. And basically that's what Paine did. He saw the struggles underway and he was saying to Americans, do you realize what you're doing? I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. So yeah. that's why, in every generation, when people look back to the revolution, they can find a fundamental, hardcore, if you like, call for democratic revolution. And, and to whatever extent Americans remain, as I, I like to believe, radicals at heart, it links to that kind of Thomas Paine uh, pamphleteering. Yeah, um, and I think, that's, I think that's like really good to know and really good to think about. Um, you know, because I, I, you know, I always get a little annoyed, like, you know, we aren't recording this that many weeks after the 4th of July, that there's like a certain kind of like leftist whose like response to that holiday is to, um, you know, is, is to sort of um, say, oh, actually, the American Revolution was like, really bad, you know, because they were all, you know, slaveholders and this, that, and the other thing, some of which is true, right? Absolutely. Uh, you know, Absolutely. but, uh, but I, I always think that it's, it's not, entirely true and it's definitely not like the emphasis right i think is wrong that uh that of course you shouldn't whitewash any of that but instead of sort of disdaining that right like if instead you could say look okay first of all don't be a weirdo about this have a hot dog enjoy some fireworks you know drink some you know drink some whiskey you know but yeah. they but uh enjoy you know enjoy the people you love you know don't be like the guy who's off the side muttering about it but also um instead of saying it's all that right you know you could say look some of it is uh, but there, there are also these these strands in that history. There's also, you know, part of the stated ideals of that revolution, and certainly the best of the revolutionaries, you know, like 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 Payne, that you know there are a lot of points of continuity between that and what we want, right? That like one way uh, of thinking, you know, and and you know, I think Marx had a complicated relationship to this idea. Sometimes he talked this way, sometimes he criticized talking this way, but certainly in my view, right, you know, that like one way to think about the relationship between those kind of historical liberal democratic revolutions and what we want right now you know to to create a more um, humane more democratic you know uh, more economically equal certainly society uh, is about uh, fulfilling kind of the unfinished business of those earlier democratic revolutions and I think the pain stuff um, like ties into that in a really powerful way 